All right, tech gremlins are out of the way. Everybody hear me all right? Um, disclaimer, I am filling in for somebody who um, originally had a talk and I got called, about, what, three days ago to give this. So if it looks, looks a little disorganized and um, so on, on, it is. So I put it together, um, hopefully can offer some useful information to you. Feel free to ask questions, interrupt, raise your hand, whatever you want. Um, start off, who am I? I my name is Anthony Hendricks. Um, I started off my career at NSA, um, doing all sorts of things for them. It was exciting work. Um, lived out back east for a little while. Um, from there, I transitioned over to um, doing some training for um, the US government, uh, both NSA, US Navy, um, various other agencies. Um, that was a lot of fun as well. I taught a lot of um, young kids out of boot camp, which was very interesting. Oh. I tend to water, sorry. Um, then from there, I moved over to um, red teaming. So I, I did penetration testing and red teaming um, as a contractor for the government for a number of years. And that was anywhere from DHS to DOD um, various other agencies as well. And then I, I joined uh, Stage 2 Security here in Utah, and that was my, my chance to, to move back home. I grew up um, up in Logan, um, now live in Salt Lake City area. Uh, so I joined Stage 2 Security, which is now Ultraviolet Security, um, and Ultraviolet uh, is the combination of a bunch of different companies, and we have you know focuses in red teaming, pen testing, um, and then various other security services, MSP, um, that sort of thing. Uh, I've spoken at um, B sides a, a few times now. Um, I've done training at, at B sides. I've done training at Black Hat. Um, if you want to learn more about Azure and cloud security, we I have a, a Black Hat course that the Bryce and I teach. Um, uh, how, however, if it's on your own dime, um, reach out to me. We'll find another way. Um, if somebody else is paying for it, um, come sign up for our class. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we get a lot of good feedback. We update it constantly. So um, yeah, it's pretty useful. We focus on the, the three major clouds, so AWS, Azure, GCP, and um, pen testing and um, Secure, doing security assessments on those clouds. All right, so basics. Um, Azure itself. Azure is um, a cloud platform. Uh, its authentication mechanism is, is called EntraID. That'll be the focus of a lot of what we talk about today. Um, compute, they call them virtual machines, pretty simple. Um, whereas, you know, AWS is instances or um, GCP is like cloud instances. Uh, where it gets a little more fuzzy is their block storage is called Azure Blobs. So blobs um, indicate block storage, which is just a general storage. Uh, serverless is called Azure Functions. Um, these can be uh, Python, uh, Node, and C Sharp, I believe. Um, so serverless means that you are providing the code, you're providing a, what you want to execute, and the cloud provider takes care of the rest. Um, container services um, is their, well, container service is their container um, provider. Um, they also have a Kubernetes service as well. Um, they call their CDN a delivery network and their data warehouse SQL warehouse. So we got some basic um, terms out of the way. Um, Enter ID, formerly Azure AD, um, and this is where I go into my rant every time about um, calling it Azure AD was a terrible idea because it had nothing to do with Active Directory. And so everyone who looks at Azure AD, they say, oh, I want Active Directory in the cloud. That sounds great. And, and that's what they treat it as. Um, and then they get frustrated and annoyed and couldn't figure out what they were doing with it and end up doing things like assigning all permissions because they couldn't figure out how to um, navigate the permission set. And so I think calling it Azure AD um, was a, a big disservice to it. Um, so switching to Entra ID, I don't really care for the name, but at least it's not Azure AD anymore. Um, but what is it? It's an authentication platform. 
and it's a web-based authentication platform. So you have all the typical um, web-based authentications that you're used to, um, like SAML and OAuth, um, OIDC. And then it's a user and permissions management framework. Um, so you can assign um, applications to a user that's signing in through this framework. What it isn't, it isn't LDAP, it isn't Kerberos, um, it doesn't have a tree-based organization, so it doesn't have a hierarchy and inher inheritance like you're used to, and it doesn't have group policy. Now it does, however, tie into on-premise Active Directory if you wanted to use that, um, that on-premise on Active Directory as your authentication um, source, well, as, as the source for users for your authentication. And this can be done through a, a bunch of different ways um, there, there are pros and cons to each one, um, but the first one here, password hash synchronization, is quickly becoming the preferred method. Um, and what this is, is basically you have an agent on a computer that's joined to your domain, um, and it takes a hash of the password hashes, so it, well, it hashes each individual hash, and then it will um, store that in the cloud. So when you authenticate against um, enter ID, um, you're authenticating against this hash of a hash that's stored within the cloud that's synchronized on a, on a regular basis. Um, it used to be that this was a one-way uh, process. So the Active Directory on-premise was a, your source of truth, and then um, if you wanted to update a password, you had to go back to that Active Directory and change your password like you would normally. Um, they've since added what's known as password write back which allows the cloud to reach back and change the on-premise password. Um, so this is, uh, has, has some benefits, but the, the primary one is that it's resilient in that if this connection between um, the cloud and your on-premise breaks for whatever reason, whether your um, internet connection goes down, whether the server that's running this Azure AD Connect goes down, um, it still functions. Um, albeit it doesn't have updated passwords, so if somebody tries to change their password locally and that connection is severed, then um, the updated password doesn't get sent up to the cloud. Um, but it does function if, if the connection's broken. Um, the next one, pass-through authentication. Um, this one uses an, another agent on, on your local network, um, and when you try to authenticate against a cloud service, um, it will pass that to the agent. The agent then contacts a domain controller, um, performs the authentication step, and then it gets passed back up the chain back to the cloud, and you get your approver deny. Um, this one, the, the disadvantage is if that connection goes down. Um, so if your um, on-premise server goes down for whatever reason, um, authentication breaks because there's no, no longer that agent to pass the authentication over to the domain controller. Um, the other interesting thing about this is, um, this host now becomes a host that's doing all this authentication against your domain controller. And um, one of the things attackers love to do is get on a host that has a bunch of users active on it and run Mimikatz. Um, Mimikatz can dump the cache credentials, so um, credentials that are used in that authentication process um, will be stored on this host, so it becomes a target for attackers. Um, the other interesting thing is you would be able to um, do things like the domain golden ticket attack from this one, um, because this host is generating Kerberos um, sessions over and over again. Um, it has that information, the key material there uh, to do a, the dump the golden ticket and then mint your own um, Kerberos tickets. Uh, there have been some other like theoretical attacks um, talking about using process injection to inject into this um, AD Connect process and then proxy um, or extract out the usernames and hashes as they're being sent over to the domain controller. Um, but they're mostly theoretical, but keep the, the point is um, that these, these systems that are connecting to Active Directory should be protected at the same level as your domain controller because they essentially have that kind of access. There's a final one um, which is very common but nobody recommends it. 
Um, and, and I think it's just because of this um, Active Directory confusion um, that happened with the name. And that is, it's called ADFS, um, Active Directory Federation Services. And basically, you're inviting the cloud to be a tenant within your local Active Directory. Um, and it has um, all, the, all the permissions and trust that you would expect to happen when you invite you know, a, a new tenant into your um, AD forest. And so while it, it sounds good on paper because you're, you're just eliminating all of the middleman, all the middleware that's doing the proxying and all that, um, it's also accepting a, a lot of risk and a, a lot of complexity in my mind because now you suddenly have expanded your Active Directory out and you have to, have to be able to manage that. Um, so almost everybody that I've seen write about it in the last you know, three to four years have, have said that ADFS has only a very few um, cases where it's necessary and they usually involve things like um, archaic hardware, like you're using some sort of smart card authentication that um, hasn't been maintained in a long time. And so it only works against um, using uh, Active Directory itself. And so it doesn't support any of the um, you know, web-based authentication to do, um, to do your um, web authentication that would pass through the cloud. It would have, it's expecting you to do like a Kerberos and then use those session credentials. So it's, it's quickly becoming um, obsolete in my mind. However, I see it all the time still. All right, so how do I find out if a domain is managed by, um, by Entra ID? And this is mainly for attackers. You know, if you're running a pen test if, and you wanna check to see what, what cloud services they're using, um, you use this URL right here. Um, you replace it with a, do, I, it doesn't even need to be a valid user. It needs to be just the valid domain. So whether it's their um, the domain that they use for email or if they have one of the dot or at on Microsoft.com domains, um, if you've seen those, um, you, uh, well, that, that would be obvious because um, you'd have on Microsoft. But if they have a domain um, set up with Entra ID and you use this URL, put in a username, um, at the domain, you'll get one of two responses. The first one is unmanaged, um, self-explanatory there. It basically is telling you um, we don't know what it is. If you get some other, um, some other value, and most of them say something like this, um, namespace type managed, uh, but depending on the services they subscribe to and various other things, you may get a lot more information out of this. And there's, there's a ton of information from um, AAD internals, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, you know, basically using OSINT type methods. So open source, you know, no authentication type methods to gather information about um, what's set up within a domain. Um, they also helpfully provide you a valid account check. Um, this is also free as in there is no um, logging repercussions, there's no um, fear of getting um, banned or anything like that. Um, you visit this URL and supply a post request with the username and it'll come back and tell you whether it's valid or not valid. Um, so if you're an attacker, um, my first step is going to be go over to a service like Dehashed where they have you know, troves of um, cracked passwords and usernames and um, start testing those usernames, see which ones are are valid still, and then you'd have a list of you know, potential passwords to use and valid user accounts. Uh, there's a tool based around this called O365 Creeper. Um, all it is is a wrapper around this post request. Uh, so you, you can do it yourself or use this Python script, um, pretty easy. All right, service principles. Um, all, they're also known as, um, well, service accounts from back in the day. So if you have um, like an application that needs credentials for something, um, you would provide it a service account and you know, set up the permissions, so on and so forth. Um, this is now called service principles within, um, within Azure and Entra ID. And basically the, the ideal setup for this is you tie it to um, an application instance. 
And when you're setting up an application, whether it's your own home build application or something you're importing, um, there's a model that um, Azure uses to um, tie this together. And so they call, it, uh, they call it resource groups. So you set up a resource group for your application. The resource group is designed to contain everything that lives within the life cycle of that application. So if you have credentials, like a service principle, if you have storage, uh, a database, all of those things would be tied into this resource group. And um, the idea is that when you're done with the application, you want to tear it down, um, you delete the resource group and delete everything within it. That means you don't leave things like service accounts hanging around that um, nobody knows what they're for anymore. And that's, you know, and plenty of times on a pen test, we would um, come across a service account that still exists, has domain admin because they didn't know what permissions it needed, and we'd use that to then, you know, walk through the network. And it, you know, it happened more times than I can count, especially on well-established government networks. Um, we'd walk in and run something like Responder and see um, accounts advertised, and then we'd be able to crack passwords. They'd usually have something simple because they didn't think about using password management, so they do a keyboard walk and call it good. And so this is the idea of a service principle and tying it to an application was designed to, to remove this risk, or at least mitigate it a little bit, um, in that you re when you remove the application, you remove the res resource group, and you remove credentials that are supplied with it. Um, these service principles can have a few different methods for authentication, um, username and password like you're used to, certificates, um, and then there's uh, something else we'll talk about, um, a managed identity. And what this is, is Azure can manage the credentials for you. So you have an application that needs access to, say, a database, um, which it can also control. And basically, what you do is you, um, you set it up so that when your application needs credentials, it will contact um, the managed service identity endpoint and request those credentials. It will be supplied with a um, session token and key, which will be valid for, uh, I think the default is 15 minutes. And you'll use those credentials on whatever service it is you're trying to access. Um, so database, uh, vaults, uh, password or secret store or something else. And then uh, after that 15 minutes, the token's invalidated and you'd need to request it again. Benefit to it, um, if you have, an, say, a vulnerability in your application that provides these secrets, um, they're only valid for a short amount of time. So at least the attacker has to go through the work of requesting them over and over again in order to get them. Um, it also requires you to um, be able to connect to the um, MSI endpoint, uh, which is internal networking. Um, it's Ada, or Azure Cloud Magic um, to set this up. So notice if you can read that, it's kind of small. The, the MSI endpoint is actually running on localhost, but it's not running on localhost. Um, it, that's just how it's provided to the um, compute instance here. And then you have to be able to um, do a post request with the MSI secret that's there as well. So um, SSRF attacks are out because you can't uh, do a post request. Um, you know, external attacks are out unless you can get um, execution on the host to um, contact the endpoint. So, like I said, this is often used with um, Azure Key Vault. Um, Key Vault is the secret store. Um, I say Key Vault, lots of people just say Vault, but I like to say, you know, Azure names it Key Vault, um, and there's also HashiCorp has a product called Vault. And so I, I, I try to spe keep them separate because this is a, an Azure-specific product. It's not a, you know, COTS software. And basically, Azure Key Vault is the secret store provided by Azure. Um, and there, there's a few different ways um, to authenticate to Key Vault. So if you have an application that's, um, that's older and doesn't support managed identities, or it runs, you know, someplace else. So Azure Key Vault is accessible outside of the cloud. So if you wanted to use it for your on-prem services as well, you'd be able to do that. And so that would put managed identities out of the picture in terms of compatibility. 
Um, so you have service principal and a certificate. These are X509 type certificates. Um, so you can use that, or you could use a service principal and secret, um, which is just username and password, essentially. And once you access that, you have um, you would be able to explore whatever is provisioned within Vault for um, that identity. And this is where, um, where we get back to the resource groups we were talking about earlier. Um, you can have um, thing, items stored within Key Vault that are specific to a resource group, and that resource group, uh, once it's removed, you can also remove these secrets stored within Key Vault. So you don't have um, secrets hanging out that um, nobody knows what they're to. All right, moving on from there. There's a concept called a consent grant within um, Azure Intra. And what this is, is I'm sure you've in, encountered it before. Um, it's, you know, it's not specific to Microsoft. Google also has it. It's an OAuth tool. Um, and basically what it is is you can um, provide an OAuth application um, permissions to your data. Um, in this case, your data stored within Azure and, and Intra. And what this is, is once you accept the permissions request here, the um, consent grant, which is an Azure specific term for it, um, you're providing some amount of permissions to this application. And these permissions can persist even through um, when, the, when the user is not active on the system, the system or within the application. Um, an example of this is um, everybody's seen the Calendly type plugins where you know you can add a, a link to your email that says set up a meeting with me and you know you click on the link and it shows you a anonymized calendar of you know free and busy times. So what what the what's happening in the background is th that application has access to um, the user's calendar and so when somebody interact somebody else interacts with that application, it reaches out to the user's calendar data um, and then presents it. Um, so it has many useful things, um, but the problem is that it's being abused quite a bit right now. So there, there's been several phishing campaigns around consent grants where they try to get the user to um, click on a link that takes them to an application, um, ask for permissions, and then once permissions are provided, they slurp all, all the data they can and pull it back and, and see what they can do with it. And this can provide all sorts of things. It can provide the user's data, user's email, user's like SharePoint access. Um, if they have specific access to service principles, so if they're provided access to a um, you know, credential for something, um, that can be within scope of this. Um, Microsoft has realized this, and over the, the last several months, they've been restricting um, some of these higher permissions to um, what they call publisher verified apps, um, which just means that Microsoft has verified that the company is a real company who produced the app. Um, and I don't even know how stringent the process is. Um, I'm betting it's they want you to, you to send them an email from a domain associated with the company and that's probably the extent of it. Um, but they have at least restricted permissions a little bit to the, um, some of the more sensitive ones, such as you know, SharePoint access. Um, and they also have a lot of work under the hood so for your, you Azure admins um, under consent workflows. So um, if you have somebody within your org who um, grants consent to one of these applications, if it happens to be an application that nobody's seen before, that nobody else in your org has used before, um, you can have it run through a separate approval pro process where it um, maybe gets a second set of eyes before um, the actual permissions are applied. Um, but I would recommend regular audits of these applications. Um, it's fairly frequent that I've seen applications that nobody, know, nobody understands what they are, um, and they have terrible names, and um, you know, the user doesn't remember even clicking on the link. And so I'd, I'd recommend going through auditing those um, on a regular basis, you know, set a, a calendar event for, you know, every three months or something like that and review the 
applications um, granted consent within Azure. Another interesting thing, um, especially if you're an attacker looking for methods for persistence, um, is this idea of guests and guest sync. Um, so one of the interesting things about um, Enter ID is that you can invite external users to be part of your org. And that means they have a, a Microsoft account through s some other company, um, and you invite them to use those same credentials within your organization as well. That means you don't have to worry about managing a username, password, email address, any of that. Um, they have access, and then you can set up you know, whatever permissions they need in order to do their job. You know, a common case where, where you might do this is if you have like a parent company and a child company, something like that where they may need, the child company needs to have people that can work in both systems or um, something of that matter. Uh, I've seen um, MSSPs use this as well. So if you have like a, a, a security provider, oh, I'm way over time. Apologize. All right, so guest sync, terrible thing if you abuse it. Um, you can have external users. You can also have them automatically synch um, synchronized to a group within the remote org. Conditional access, talk to me about that later. MFA is cool. Um, there at the end here is a bunch of tools that um, I just wanted to have on the slides for you to take a look at if you wanted to audit your security. So um, take a look at those. I'll post the slides up later. Uh, and then I also have Azure Goat here, which is a uh, fully deployable um, Azure environment where you can go through and practice techniques of stealing um, tokens to uh, expand your access. So worth taking a look at. Um, there is where I'll post the slides. I'll have them up a little bit later today.